I'd like to present uh, this talk tonight. Um, I was asked to present a talk on the nature of science and answer the question, has, is evolution good for science? And the, what are my qualifications to address this issue? Well, this is, a, this is obviously not a strictly scientific issue. This is a matter of a personal opinion. And so all, I'm, all I can do is share with you my own perspectives. And so this is one man's view. Um, but I do have one advantage in that um, for a large part of my life, I was a hardcore evolutionist. And now for many years, I have been a Christian. And for many years, I have been a um, creationist. And so um, I do feel that gives me some perspective on this issue. Uh, I remember a, a dear sister in Christ in one of the churches we have attended who got up and gave her testimony, and it was the shortest testimony I've ever heard. She got up and she said, I lived for many, many years without Christ, and now I have lived many years with Christ. And please believe me when I say it is so much better to be with Christ. And, and that was her testimony as she sat down. And um, I, I guess I can express that as a scientist, is for many, many years I was a hardcore evolutionist, then for many years I was a compromised Christian and a theistic evolutionist, and now I'm a Bible-believing Christian, and I've never found science more exciting than at this point in my life. So, the title I'd like to use for this talk is When Good Science Goes Bad, A Christian View of Science. So, I think we all understand that there is a faith versus science issue. That is, if I had to choose between faith in God or submitting to the latest scientific understanding, I would choose faith in God. I would choose faithfulness to Christ above all things, including science, which I highly value. And so, you know, many of us as Christians, all of us, I think, as Christians, uh, would agree that if someone held a sword to our throat and said, renounce Christ or die, we would die, right? But when we go to the university, a clever professor can talk us out of our faith. How can that be? Well, it shouldn't be. In the end, the ultimate test of reality is Christ. He is the truth. And we must not be taken captive. But, okay, that said, I would like to strongly urge you not to be trapped by this paradigm. Because faith versus science is the strategy that the other side has used unbelievably successfully to defeat us consistently in every court case. Because we get up and we want to present our scientific understanding of reality, and they say, you may not address science because you're coming at it from a point of view of faith. So you're disqualified from addressing the scientific issues. And that's the basic strategy they've used I was talking to a, a, a lawyer recently who said, we have basically won zero legal cases in America on the, on the intelligent design versus uh, atheistic teaching. Why are we losing every single battle? It's because we have let them use that strategy and we've let them back us into a corner and we have not developed an effective counter strategy. And so, um, I would like to suggest that this is the true nature of the conflict. It is faith, faith versus faith and science versus science. So we do have a faith-based position. There are aspects of what we believe that we can't prove scientifically. We trust Christ and we trust the Word of God. But the other side also has profound faith-based issues and it becomes faith versus faith. That's the most fundamental conflict. But more specifically, there is a conflict in terms of scientific issues. And it's our science versus their science. And we must put a, a wall, a firewall, 
between our faith and our science. And we must not let them confuse the two issues. Now, when you go to a typical debate or you go to, into the legal arena where, where the question of you know, freedom of speech within the schools arises, what you'll see is every time we try to address science, they try to get the discussion to be about religion because they know if, we get, if they get us talking about our faith, then they can use the uh, separation of church and state and they win every time. And so we have to be uh, innocent as doves but wise as serpents about this. And um, this concept of faith versus faith and science versus science, separated by a firewall, um, I, I discussed this with um, a legal advocate in the United States recently before he um, engaged in a mock trial between, uh, about the ID movement. And he, he embraced this strategy and he feels that it won the day. And they were actually, they, based upon the, the audience, uh, they clearly won the debate. And so I believe this is a very strategic uh, element. And when we go to talk to witness to others, again, I think we should show to them that this is not science versus faith. It's faith versus faith and science versus science. So the evolutionists hold a series of faith-based positions. And as we investigate their positions more and more closely, we realize more and more clearly that they have a faith-based position. To begin with, they believe in a spontaneous universe. The universe made itself. And if you probe and challenge, you will find out that they believe that because they want to believe that. And that it is a faith-based position. And they'll play all kinds of games to try to rationalize it and make it, they'll use scientific jargon to make it sound like a scientific position, but it is a faith-based position. Then they go to the spontaneous life. They say, after the world made itself, then life made itself. And if you challenge them and ask them, how could that possibly be, you'll quickly find that they are based, that this is a faith-based position. They say, it must be true, because we know there's no God, and how else could you explain life? And then you go on to say, uh, they go on to the next faith-based position, which is the spontaneous. Once you have life, that life will just spontaneously get better and better through mutation and selection. And we realize that is not an honest or scientifically defensible position. It is strictly faith-based. And then they go on to believe that once life is, has arisen, it will develop self-consciousness and intelligence spontaneously. And you ask them, how, how do you justify that? Since we don't even know where intelligence comes from or how the brain works, how can you rationalize that scientifically? And you find very quickly it's a faith-based position. They just believe it. Because how else? Since they've already rejected God, that's the only, only other hypothesis. And lastly, they believe that once you have um, a brain, that, um, that life, which is meaningless and going nowhere, would naturally discover what truth is. And that, and that there's such a thing as truth in a meaningless and, uh, and a directionless universe. So these are the fundamental, the five fundamental faith-based positions that they hold. This is their creed. And what we realize is that we can actually dismantle these strongholds. For example, we can really now rigorously show that mutation plus selection, plus selection does not result in spontaneous ascent of life. In fact, the best selection can do is slow down degeneration. And how do we attack these strongholds? We use science versus science. And we refuse to let our science be blended with our faith. So when I go into a university and talk about Mendel's accountant and genetic entropy, I will not be, um, uh, what's the term? Um, I won't be uh, sucked into uh, talking about my faith in that context. I say, this is, I'm talking only science today. If you want to talk to me later, I'll tell you about my, what I, my personal beliefs, but I'm only talking science today. I will not let them cloud these two, these two dimensions. And so I believe this is, uh, this is a strong suit for us now. Science is a method 
A lot of people seem to think that science is somehow mysterious, and unless you have a PhD, you can't understand it or apply it. But it is nothing more than a systematic way of learning. We go through observation, hypothesis, experimentation, and experiments need to be independently validated by other people, or it doesn't carry weight. This is something we can understand on a very logical level. Anyone can understand this. Science is a tool, and this is, um, makes science very, very good. Science yields technology through the process of invention, innovation, development, refinement, commercialization. That is why we can feed six and a half billion people today. And science can be a weapon. Science can be a powerful weapon to empower the elite, the power elite. And so in war, technology through science can give success. It can create wealth, especially for the power elite. And it can be a powerful agent for ideological um, battle. And so the Nazis in Germany and the communists in Russia and China you looked at their scientists as pawns for their own empowerment. So is science good or bad? I believe that there are a lot of Christians who, are, who actually perceive science as bad because the power elite has taken control of science and used it as a weapon against Christians and Christendom. They have come to think that science is bad. But, but science as a tool is neither good nor bad except in the context of how we use it. So Abel used rocks to build an altar to make a sacrifice to the Lord. Cain used the same tool, a rock, to kill his brother. Is a rock good or bad technology? It just depends on how you use it. Science is inherently godly. We were given the dominion mandate, and the only way to fulfill the dominion mandate is to use our brains and to use all the resources available to us. It, and if we look at um, Joseph or Daniel, we see that godly men study hard and use reason. And we know that operational science is where our wealth comes from, where our health comes from, where our food comes from, where our ability to communicate with another, one another comes from. And so operational science in its normal operation is, is good. And the fathers under, of science were all believers in God. And they weren't all saved, but they all acknowledged God and they all openly acknowledged God. And so in its, in its truest form, science is good. And those early scientists all talked about thinking God's thoughts after him. But science can go bad. It can empower an elite. It can be used for self-glorification. It can be, become an idol that people uh, lift up on an altar and worship. It can be dishonest. And it can be a tool against God. And that's why many Christians have come to look at science as a bad word. Why there are so few Christians who go into science. Why most Christian schools struggle to find a good science teacher. So there's been a history of scientific corruption, past and present. In some modern examples to me of where science has been politicized and corrupted would include uh, the unscientific uh, banning of DDT, the unscientific arguments that were used to shut down the nuclear energy industry at a time when we desperately needed it, the unscientific arguments for global cooling in the 70s, the unscientific arguments for the global warming in the present, and the very unscientific Mother Earth pseudosciences that filled the newspapers and filled the magazines. So these things are, in my opinion, are examples of um, science that's off track. It's, it's based upon uh, wishful thinking or political thinking rather than rigorous science. So I'd like to just go back now in history and think about science where it's gone wrong in the past. And I'd like to just consider for a moment uh, this famous 
case of the trial of Galileo. It's been his, uh, many, many people have tried to spin this historical event as a science versus faith conflict. And I've looked into it enough to see that that is not true. So Galileo was a proponent of the heliocentric view, which is the earth goes around the sun and not vice versa. And he was tried for heresy by the Roman Inquisition in 1633. So here we have pictures of Galileo on the left and uh, his uh, antagonist, um, I believe it's Pope Urban VIII. And these two men had a personal conflict. And I'd just like to look at this conflict and see if we can see parallels in the present. So Galileo was characterized typically uh, in, the, in, the, in most uh, the popular version uh, as the honest, hardworking, truth-seeking scientist. And most people kind of assume he's a secular non-believer, just, you know, trying to overcome the ignorance of the church. And on the other side, we have the ignorant Christians suppressing good science and suppressing uh, the freedoms of the secular scientist. But let's look, let's just scratch the surface now, Don Batten and I were talking just the other day. We were saying pretty much every argument that's presented against our position sounds good on the surface because it's been glossed over. It has a gilded, uh, gilding on it. Just scratch a little bit. Just look a little bit beneath the surface and all these arguments look very different. And so let's see if that happens in this instance. Galileo. Galileo was a Christian. He was a, a strongly professing Christian. Only God knows if he was saved, but he was certainly a professing Christian, like Copernicus and Kepler, who, uh, whom he followed and who also were pioneers in, our, in, in expanding our understanding of the nature of the solar system. All three of these men are Christians. All three of them overthrew the old understanding of the nature of the solar system. He was a strong advocate of freedom of inquiry. He kept saying, let's, let's not regulate what people think or say or print. Let open dialogue reign. He was a dissident from establishment science. He was bucking the system. He suffered personal persecution and was threatened with torture and death, and his books were banned. Okay. Now, in the terms of the ID evolution movement, which side does this sound like? It sounds a lot like our side, doesn't it? Here's Galileo's opposition, a secular scientific dogma that wasn't church dogma that he was opposing. He was opposing the, the, the cosmological model uh, proposed by a Greek, Ptolemy, which was, in a, uh, which was totally erroneous, but, but perfectly secular in its origin. It involved the abuse of institutional authority. The church was preventing him from just practicing the freedom to think and speak and write. It involved a corrupt church official. The popes are not necessarily model, Christ-like models. And it involved the Catholic Inquisition, which does not reflect Christianity. The Catholic Inquisition is the antithesis of the, of the true body of Christ. The Catholic Inquisition represented the, uh, the persecution of true believers and, and, other, and others, but it was, doesn't reflect Christendom. And bad science won the day, okay? At least it seemed to win the day. So Galileo was under house arrest for the rest of his life and his books were banned. So in the short term, he seemed to lose, which involved a power elite and their abuse of authority. Now in terms of the ID evolution controversy, which side does this sound like? This is uh, kind of interesting, isn't it? 
Galileo versus the Pope. Are we talking about science versus faith? We're talking about faith versus faith, one Christian against another, and we're talking about science versus science, scientific arguments that were uh, in opposition and where the only answer to the scientific conflict would involve experimental proofs one way or the other. Use science to resolve scientific controversy. So here's another interesting story. And this is something I didn't really realize until very recently. This is the flat earth versus the globe controversy. Faith versus science. This is not faith versus science. It's been countless times Christians have been, creationists have been accused of being flat earthers. And it's been argued that the church favored a flat earth model of reality and even when powerful evidences against it arose, in their stupidity, they continued to promote a flat earth model. And so there's an interesting book that some of you might like to uh, check into. It's called Inventing the Flat Earth by Russell. Because it turns out that this whole uh, concept is an invention. It started with uh, Washington Irving, who, who wrote a piece of historical fiction. You know, this is uh, the same guy who wrote The Legend of Sleepy Hollow and Rip Van Winkle. And he wrote historical fiction about Columbus. And he made up a story about how, Colum how before Columbus, everyone in Europe was thinking the earth was flat. But he, as a diligent, secular, enlightened individual, wanted to prove it was round. And how the church opposed him. And how he was won the day. That's what I read in my history book when I was in school. I think a lot of you read that in your history books. It didn't happen. All of Europe knew the world was round. They didn't know, in fact, many Europeans knew the circumference of the world. And so that entire story is an incredible fiction. And now serious historians will affirm that that, that isn't what happened at all. But around the time of Darwin, when, when intellectuals were uh, attacking the Christian worldview, they embraced this fictitious concept and started promoting the idea that, that, that Christianity promotes a flat earth. Even in scripture, you'll find verses that indi clearly indicate that the world is round. And at no point in church history did any uh, church leader promote a flat earth perspective. It's a total fabrication. And so, some people will tell you there's still a flat earth society today. Do you think that's true? There is. Go Google it. Google flat earth society. You will find there is a flat earth society. What is it really? If you go to that website, what you'll find is that it is hateful, atheists, mocking Christians. And so they say, we're stupid Christians and we believe in a fat, flat earth and we know this is true and here are our arguments. It is totally an invention designed to ridicule Christians. And yet this concept of history is widely permeating still throughout the culture. And in, there are still textbooks, some textbooks, that still make this claim. And so what we see here is not faith versus science. In this case, what we see is the corruption of science, the corruption of truth, where we're dealing with deliberate fraud and we're dealing with a type of character assassination. So now I'd like to come to the main uh, point of the talk. I was asked to answer the question, has evolutionary theory hindered science? Well, if it's wrong, obviously it has hindered science. We believe that it is incorrect and any, any Thing that is being taught in science textbooks that is not correct is clearly bad for science. But it's much more than that. Because science has often been wrong here or there or somewhere else. Science has never had a perfect understanding of truth. But it's gone much deeper than that. Because evolutionary theory has become a tool by a power elite, intellectual elite, which is the power elite, to hijack science 
and science resources. And it has been a corruption of the spirit of science. I'd like to uh, contend those, those points. Let's look at the evolution, as, it, as, as how evolution hijacks science. The Darwinian agenda now drives much of science. So for example, in terms of biological funding, uh, funding is hugely dedicated to the study of evolution. And um, I don't know exactly what fraction of all grants are, are bio biological research grants involve evolution, but I know that pretty much every grant proposal needs to salute evolution and somehow say that, it, this, that somehow it's some aspect of the grant proposal. Uh, and when you look at the nature of the evolutionary studies that are being done, they're just beating the evolutionary drum. That's what those, the, all this money and all this research are people who are just beating the ideological drum to drum up support for this, for this worldview. Now, in terms of, as you go into the published literature, like if you pick up the journals of science or nature or the national proceedings of, uh, proceedings of the National Academy of Science, if you just page through the uh, table of contents, you, article after article after article after article is about evolution. I, I, I have not studied to see what fraction of all published literature in the biological arena is about evolution, but it's very, very large. I have noticed that uh, the dominant number of articles in science and nature tend to be about evolution, biologi biological articles. And so, uh, so they've hijacked the funding, that drives more and more scientists to go where the funding is, which means they've hijacked scientific staff, and then lastly, they've hijacked the, the, the transmission of truth through journals. And so, uh, if you produce results that don't fit the biological, the Darwinian paradigm, you will find it very difficult to get published. And it will be viewed as subversive or seditious. You're, you're, you're violating the, pilot, the party line. And what's, what are you up to, really? And so, uh, there is a not... Peer review is designed to preserve high quality in science, and it's very important. But when things get politicized, what happens is peer review becomes an ideological filter, not just a quality filter. And I believe I see that extensively. And I believe that um, because of this, true science, the operational science that actually gives us wealth and health, has been undervalued and underfunded. I, I, my own experience within academia is if you do something like agriculture or even medicine, it's not considered the really elite research. You have to be up in the ivory tower and ideally in some way beating the evolutionary drum to really be prestigious within the university, with a few exceptions. Um, and so there is a cost to all this propaganda, not just that they're perpetuating information that is not correct, but that it actually detracts from real science. So lastly, I'd like to argue that um, evolution corrupts the spirit of science. Science is supposed to involve mutual respect, uh, giving each other freedom to speak, con respectfully considering one another's points of view, and the most godly science, of course, should honor God. But what we're seeing is that more and more science mocks God, becomes an idolatrous thing, more and more scientists, you know, the, one of the characteristics I see in myself and my colleagues when I was an evolutionist was we were very self-exalting, incredibly proud and arrogant. Because you see, as an evolutionary scientist, there's a tendency to look at humanity as just naked apes, but the scientists are kind of like the enlightened gods. And there's this amazing arrogance associated with that. And of course, uh, True science seeks truth, but when science is corrupted, it can become an ideological weapon instead of truth-seeking. And any truth that doesn't support the ideology will be suppressed, and things that, are only, that aren't quite good science will actually be promoted. 
And so it can suppress dialogue and open inquiry because it is an ideological position and it can violate academic freedom, which is a very serious reality. I, I, I am aware, I've become aware through, many, uh, through a network that there are many creation-believing scientists in the universities. We're still very much a minority, but there's a significant number, but most of the people are undercover they're, because they're, they, they know that if they go public, number one, they'll experience, they'll be mocked, they'll be shunned, they'll lose their funding, and it will become almost impossible to publish, with some exceptions. I know that there are some, some creation scientists who have gotten a, a strong enough position in the university they can function, but generally that's not the case. So Darwinian followers have repeatedly corrupted science. I, I'm going to, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm making my argument very strong. So maybe, you know, I tend to overstate things to make my case. So, so maybe I'm going to overstate it and you can forgive me and, and we can take a step back. But I do see some very dark aspects to the Darwinian movement. One is that I believe that Darwinian followers have a tendency to seize power. And why shouldn't they? If you believe that there's no morality except the imperative to continue to evolve, if you believe that might makes right, if you believe that the ends justify the means, if you believe that the survival of the fittest, even within academia, why would you play fair? I believe that um, the Darwinian followers, because of their strong ideology, I'm talking about the radical Darwinists. I'm not talking about just the, the biologist who teaches biology and happens to believe Darwinism because he was taught it. I'm talking about the ideologues, the, the radicals, the 10% that, um, you know, are hateful toward Christians. The, Darwin, the hardcore Darwin followers propagate ideology. They're not that interested in truth. They tend to vigorously attack their opponents. They will use slander. They will even undermine, you know, I believe that they, they um, will deliberately try to ruin other people's careers. And for the hardcore Darwinists, I believe they are happy to violate other people's rights. And, and lastly, I see evidence of dual standards. I see good papers being rejected routinely, but I see some really shoddy evolutionary work being published in top journals just because they're beating the Darwin drum. If you're beating the Darwin drum, you don't have to do very good research to get your papers into PNAS or science or nature because that's, that's the politically correct place to be. So, for me, I, I, what I've come to feel, and again, I'm talking about my perspective. I'm not talking for CMI or anyone else. This is just, you know, uh, 30 years of, of experience from academia, both as an evolutionist and, and a believer. Um, no wonder that evolution is wrongly perceived as foundational to all science. You will hear many people argue against creationists, you are a threat to science. And evolution is essential to science. It is the foundation of science. They make that argument powerfully. And a lot of uh, unthinking people believe that. But the reason that perception has been widely perpetuated is because there is a power elite. See, the intellectual community is the power elite in our society. They, they train future leaders and they, have, and they shape the ideology of leadership in our culture. And so the universities are the power base. The power elite have imposed evolution on science using the good name of science for their agenda. This is my point of view. Evolution is not the basis of scientific advance. Number one, evolution largely speculates about the distant past. That is not the scientific method. Evolution focuses on microevolution, and they've, you know, it's, it's uncontested. They think that if they prove a million cases of microevolution, they've proved evolutionary theory. No, they're just showing adaptation, and they can show it forever and ever and spend all our tax money showing it, it doesn't prove macroevolution. Macro Here's a claim that's often made by the evolutionists. Crop improvement and animal improvement are possible because of evolutionary theory. Well, I'm trained in plant breeding and plant genetic engineering, and I am here to tell you that is so wrong. Man has been doing 
plant and animal breeding since the beginning of history. We did not need Darwin to learn how to do artificial selection. And in fact, Darwin took what was already being done in plant and animal breeding and tried to extrapolate that into the wild to argue for natural selection. So another common argument that you'll hear is that all the important things like the discovery of antibiotic resistance or the development of resistance to insecticides wouldn't have been possible without Darwin. Well, that's foolish because these are things that we simply observe to happen in the present. And we don't have to have an evolutionary worldview to know that, uh, that bacteria can become resistant to antibiotic. We just, it's empirical. Another argument you will hear is that um, all our, you know, thanks to evolutionary theory, we have modern agriculture, modern medicine, and, and technological improvements such as communication systems. Well, it's simply, there's no relationship. Um, retroactively, the Darwinists claim all previous scientists. Here's an interesting claim that you'll hear. Yes, Newton was a Christian, and he believed that God's hand was in everything. But if he lived today, he would have been with us. That's, you'll hear that. Uh, because he just was back in the old ignorant days and didn't know enough. But if, we, if he just read our journals, he would be an evolutionist. Well, if he read the journals, he probably would be an evolutionist, but it has to do with uh, systematic um, advocacy. And lastly, uh, they retroactively claim all advances, uh, whereas, in fact, many great inventors are believers. Um, retroactively, they also redefine science. Even though science was founded by believers, they say, well, if they had been... <laughs> In these enlightened days, they would have been naturalists, which is simply not true. So, um, Don mentioned this quote uh, earlier today, but I'll repeat it. Dr. Mark Kirchner, member of the National Academy of Science, uh, professor at the Harvard Medical School, uh, sums it up this way. In fact, over the last 100 years, almost all of biology has proceeded independent of evolution, except evolutionary biology itself. It would be hard to be an evolutionary biologist without talking about evolution. But uh, he says, molecular biology, biochemistry, physiology have not taken evolution into account at all. So we don't need evolutionary theory for science. I'd like to just um, quickly mention uh, some specific offenses that I think have been perpetuated by evolutionary scientists. Uniformitarian geology was forced on scientists based upon philosophical grounds. Lyell's argument was, we can't allow any type of catastrophism, even if the data suggests it, because philosophically, that's not scientific. Mendel's discoveries were lost for almost 50 years. Now, it turns out that his paper was always in the libraries throughout Europe. In what way was it lost? It was suppressed because it was not supportive of Darwin's theory until they discovered mutation. Scientific Marxism is claims to be scientific and claims to have uh, is dedicated, Marx dedicated his Marxism to, uh, which is, you know, Marxism is ridiculous. We now all realize that Marx was wrong about everything, but he dedicates his book to Darwin. In Russia, under Stalin, there became a corruption of science that was led by a man named Lysenko, and it's called Lysenkoism, which involved um, a bizarre evolutionary point of view that said genes don't exist, genetics doesn't exist, and uh, all traits are acquired, uh, all, all traits can be uh, acquired through um, use or inheritance of acquired traits. And Lysenko actually not only forced his bizarre form of evolution on the entire R communist Russia, he actually exiled, imprisoned, and killed scientists who were audacious enough to believe that genes are real and that Mendel Mendelian genetics is sound. Uh, we have um, the eugenics movement and scientific racism, which was an offense that came from Darwinian uh, scientists, and we have the modern era of sociobiology and total amorality. These are great offenses against culture and our society and mankind 
that come out of the Darwinian mentality. We have, right now, the space program is driven by one primary mandate, discovery of life in outer space, extraterrestrial life. That's a, a pure fantasy. How did, they, how did the Darwinists get control of the entire space program? The Big Bang fantasy, the repression to today of Darwinian dissidents, uh, the cover-up of the fatal flaws in neo-Darwinian theory, and the foolishness of junk DNA. All that are specific offenses that have hurt science that came out of Darwinian, the, hard, the hardcore Darwinian party. There's something specific, two specific instances that I think are, are outrageous and that have really hurt science, and now I think they're, um, we're starting to be able to see it, and maybe someday everyone will see it. The one is the collapse of neo-Darwinian theory, and it is a powerful deception that can now be shown to be wrong. And so we know that mutations are bad, we know that mutation rate is too high, we know most mutations that are bad are unselectable, we know most good mutations are unselectable, and we know that there's a problem with linkage. And these problems can now be shown to make the classic concept of mutation plus selection, progress through mutation and selection, ludicrous. And yet that, that simple concept has ruled universities for decades. And the population geneticists have known all the problems with it and have failed to communicate those problems to society. They just, um, and so that's, that's either, uh, either that's um, wicked or a form of um, negligence, not to communicate something so fundamental. And lastly, uh, junk DNA. You know, this is my field, genetics, and uh, it's increasingly being recognized that this is the scientific blunder of the century. Uh, the the Ev Darwinists knew that with the discovery of DNA and the discovery of the complexity of DNA and the genetic code and then the growing uh, knowledge of the unbelievable complexity of, of our genome, that they needed to denigrate the genome to help people believe that it could have happened by accident. And so there was a, a paper published called So Much Junk DNA in Our Genome. And you know what their argument was for that pa underlying that paper? Was the mutation problem. They said, um, if the whole genome is functional, then the actual mutation rate is phenomenally high within the functional genome, which in selection couldn't deal with it. So they said, well, the genome must be relatively small, and there really must not to be too much information there. And this junk DNA was used as the most powerful argument they would have said, most powerful argument for evolution. Junk DNA proves that we're filled with uh, fossil remnants of ancient events, and that most of our DNA is just due to ac genetic accidents in the past. Well, to summarize what's been happening in the last three or four years, uh, that paradigm has collapsed. And I'm not going to go into the details, except that there's now overwhelming evidence that most of the genome is functional. And so um, the junk DNA term itself has largely been abandoned by any serious scientist. Uh, here's a quote from John Maddock at the University of Queensland, Brisbane. The failure to recognize the full implications of this, particularly the possibility that the intervening non-coding sequences may be, transmitted parallel, may be transmitting parallel information, may well go down as one of the biggest mistakes in the history of molecular biology. Here's a, here's a quote from Dr. Francis Collins, who was the leader of the Genome Project. And this is, these were his parting words as he uh, recently retired from, from being the, the leader of the Human Genome Project through, its, through all of its um, development. He says, only about 1.5% of the genome is coding for protein. The rest of it is probably involved in this regulatory stuff. That's a technical term, I hope you understand that. Regulatory stuff. And for a long time, we were a bit dismissive, actually extremely dismissive, about the other 98.5% of the genome and said that a lot of it was kind of junk. No, they said it was junk. 
They said it was worse than junk. They said it was parasitic DNA that was taking down the genome and something we should get rid of. I don't think people are using the word junk anymore. He's right. When they are talking about the genome, because the more we study, the more functions we find in that filler DNA, which is not filler at all. That's the state of the art, is we've gone from believing that 1.5% of the genome is functional to realizing that it's mostly all functional. And from our point of view, it's all functional except the parts that have been broken through genetic degeneration. And lastly, part of their agenda, a powerful strategy, is they have redefined science while we weren't looking. Historically, science was defined in terms of thinking God's thoughts after him. The modern view, which is coercively imposed upon all public institutions, and more and more is being forced upon Christian schools, is that true science must be philosophical naturalism, which denies God and says that all that matters is material stuff. But I would like to suggest that, that what we need is true classroom objectivity, where there is open inquiry, open dialogue, where the teachers can teach the controversy to stimulate student thinking, and where students can go where the evidence leads them. Freedom of choice. So this is a famous painting of Plato and Aristotle. And it's really a, a, an interesting painting, because these two, Plato was Aristotle's teacher, and Aristotle was the student. And these are the two, two of the great intellects of the ancient world. And one's pointing up like this, and one's pointing down because they had a fundamental differently, fundamentally different view of reality. Plato believed in one God, and he believed all reality came from the spiritual realm. And Aristotle said, no, reality, the deep down, the bottom line for reality is the material world. Two fundamentally different points of view about what the nature of reality is. Both great intellects, they could dialogue, they could disagree, I believe they respected one another. Isn't that the way the science classroom should work? So, my closing comment is um, that all science is driven by motives. There are people who say to us, you aren't objective. You have a motive. You have a belief system. Well, guess what? Have you ever seen a scientist who has no motivation? I think he'd be a pretty poor scientist. In fact, he'd probably just sleep in every day, wouldn't he? Um, basically, everyone has motives. Everyone has belief systems. But I believe that all scientists are driven by something, one of these three things. Self-interest, ideology, or altruism. I've seen a lot of self-interest in the scientific world. Promote yourself, your reputation, your funding, your salary, your prestige. I've been guilty of all that. That's often been of great interest to me. I've seen scientists driven by ideology. And a big part of ideology is ego. I'm right, you're wrong. Winning the argument. But some science is driven by truly caring about other people. And I would like to suggest that as um, Christians who are interested in science, the reason we're engaging in science and the reason we're engaging in this truth war is because we care about other souls. And that that is the best motivation for being a scientist. Whether we're trying to feed them or give them medicine or improve their life, quality of life, or most importantly, that we want to feed their soul with that which is true. That, that's the highest motive behind science. And I, I sense that spirit in this room tonight. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.